up next we have Binary Beer, uh, also Binary Tech. So Binary Beer was founded in 2016 by Michael uh, and Brooke Burton. Um, they are from Wollongong and they developed products, well, originally developed products to revolutionise the beer supply chain. Um, track beer kegs when they're full, if they need maintenance, uh, logistics. Um, hi, developer Steve. Um, and using this technology, they've pivoted um, and they're tracking uh, using the technology they developed to track beer kegs. Um, Michael founded Binary Tech in 2019 uh, with the goal of connecting everything. So not a small goal there. <laughs> um, so Michael and James are joining us from Wollongong. We'll bring them up to the stage now to say hey. Um, and we're going to do a fireside chat with them and developer Steve. Uh, also, fun fact, uh, today is James's two-year anniversary, so happy anniversary, James. Uh, <laughs> happy anniversary talk. Um, and thanks for coming to join us, guys. Uh, I just need to... Hello. Yeah, Hello. Okay. Hello. It's getting crowded in here. Oh, <laughs> uh, right, there we go. Um, just before we get underway, you might be wondering why you can see my green screen because that's not how green screens <laughs> works. We're using, <laughs> it's not playing nice tonight. So I'm using imagination and picture, if you will, there's a fireside chat thing happening behind me and it was amazing. Anyway, thank you all for joining us uh, again. Um, absolutely love the, oh, I say again because we had one not love you group. But anyway, Thank you for joining us tonight at the Nova IT Meetup. Um, tell us a little bit about um, what you're working on now. James, you did say that you are running, you're trying to melt your computer at the moment doing developer -y things. So I am keen to find out what you're doing. Uh, oh, okay, if yeah. It's, yeah. If it's secret, don't tell me. Uh, one of our first products. So sorry, I'm James, Michael. Um, we a little while ago, but it was sort of like our side gig to Binary Beer. Uh, one of our first projects was uh, tracking the position of a uh, cell antenna, so a 4G, 3G um, monitor. We developed this, and it goes on the back of a, an antenna, and it tells you what way it's facing. That's the idea. Uh, so that product's been over there and is working now. I'm working on some improvements to that firmware to provide a little bit more accuracy, work a bit more reliably, and doing you know, that sort of Impro general improvement stuff, but it's sort of a lot of heavy number crunching, taking in a lot of accelerometer data, magnetometer data, and then filtering it. So that's why my computer is melting, is because I'm doing thousands of values, trying <laughs> to make, just testing the hell out of it to make sure it's not going to break, more or less. But uh, yeah, it's not really melting. It's kind of melting the sensor more than my computer, but my computer has to display all the junk that is currently melting. <laughs> nice. Um, now, um, I build a lot of IoT stuff, and one thing that I always struggle against is weather, and I mm -hmm. noticed how nice that case was. I was appreciating that case when you yeah. held it up. Um, the um, What did you have to go through to get that ready for, like, as far as testing goes, like having it out in the field, hitting it with lightning? Like, <laughs> what did you do to it to make sure that you built, like, something indestructible or near indestructible yeah i guess are you going to answer this change or you want me to start, uh, you can start answering. Yeah. Oh, oh, well, getting this is actually going into africa so in kenya where they have uh you know, wow. quite a lot of well it's actually pretty mild weather but it gets pretty hot and uh in locations yeah. where if you have to send out a technician to work on these cell towers often by the time they have to come down there's a lion waiting to eat them so it's <laughs> actually pretty difficult to maintain these assets and uh you know making sure that they lasted was important um one of the main tests they asked for is not like what is the ingress protection but can an elephant stand on it and that's the the law about how how strong it has to be <laughs> wow. okay <So> that's <laughs> yeah uh, a lot. how do you test for that so that's, oh, that's no. how you so it's, it's, it's so, a fully custom design enclosure. It's, it's our mold. We had it designed in Sydney. Uh, and yeah, it's two pieces. It's got a little O-ring on it there. And the idea is it's got that little weather gap in the middle. And a uh, big part of the design is making sure that weather gap did its job, kept the water out. And the, all that ridging and ribbing you saw is to stop the elephant from crushing it. Uh, and I was going to say, so do you work out the average weight of an elephant and then park a car on top of it or something? Or like, how do you test yeah, for that? Yeah, they other analogs. Um, for the longest time, it was a lack of elephants. But uh, we ended up uh, driving the car over it instead. And, you know, they all know nice. the car is. And apparently that's kind of the equivalent of an elephant, you know, close enough for, for their liking. So oh, that, that was good enough. But yeah. uh, at the same time, no. you know, when we spoke to the industrial designer, it's a different design language we speak in. And that's where we talk about IP protection, having these two yeah. layers of you know protection so that directed jets or anything couldn't get in there, you know, things like that. Yeah. 
Um, so with the, you're talking about network connectivity as well, like what sort of uh, connectivity have you played with, looked at using, like what, what's, what's done it for you? Oh, can I tell this one? Yeah, go, yeah, sure. Go uh, yeah, we started <laughs> off, okay, with this idea of connecting kegs because it's just a marriage of two passions of, of the beer and the IoT side of things. And when we first started out, we were using just little, um, you know, like ESP8266 little Wi-Fi chips. And, uh, yeah, we programmed them in the Arduino IDE to be this, you know, self-contained little sensor that could ideally talk over people's networks, like, you know, over their Ethernet connections or, sorry, Wi-Fi connections and send data out about where it is and temperature and stuff like that. Um, the hmm. huge issue to scale there is that, first of all, you don't always get to borrow Wi-Fi where IoT objects might go. And if you try and roll out your own infrastructure, people like to either steal it or unplug it so they can plug in their own phone charger and you lose your gateways. Um, That's next, true. Next, uh, we worked with um, Sigfox was going to take over Australia by storm in the LP WAN market. Um, we, you know, we, uh, for business reasons and the rollout rate of that connectivity and the need for deep indoor coverage, we kind of realized that Sigfox wasn't really going to get us there in time. Um, LoRaWAN is yep. a fantastic technology that we love, and um, the students James was one of. We developed um, our next level of prototypes using LoRaWAN as well, working with the university and the local councils as well with their with their coverage. Um, again, you know, in certain areas we would have to set up our own infrastructure though, and that's where we have to make the decision: Are we going to be like a, a hardware tech platform company, or are we going to try and become our own telco? You know, but that's kind of we've got meshed and triple enco that are trying to do that for us so you know waiting for them to build up their ecosystems we kind of realized that you know leveraging cellular technologies lp wan technologies would probably be a way to go to market faster provided back at the time the cell tower the cell uh telcos would actually you know turn on their network so that would be cat m1 and nbiot and um that's kind of where we work primarily today for connectivity of our devices um the cat m1 network being yeah. Slightly more expensive, slightly more power hungry, but you know, vast amounts of data are possible. And NBIoT mm -hmm. being, um, you know, a little bit cheaper, a little bit slower to send data, but um, yeah, perfectly adequate for something like a beer kick that only needs to send a few bytes of data each day. Yeah, and then of course the uh, upcoming. I don't know. We've talked about this too. The uh, the five G emergence and uh, yeah, how both networks are just basically being put into that now, which I think is really cool because yeah. it's like yeah. we've already got the network there. Just go cross more frequencies. So yeah, yeah and that's. 5g um with the uh, <laughs> with the um the software side of things like how have you managed um because obviously there's a lot of open source libraries out there some of them may or may not do what you want to do like have you um how much have you sort of invested in that whole adaptation of libraries or have you custom written things to run on there um it, it's a bit of both actually so on the front end side of uh, the server end we use ton of open source stuff it's accessible we can use it it's well documented nice. we big advocates there embedded side it gets a bit tricky because uh you're kind of limited on space so one library might be really really good for your application but a bit big and that's mm. where usually you've got to get it start trimming it and something like that so it's embedded it's sort of like you pick and choose what you want so it's nice that it's there but you don't end up really using it you kind of just grab what you need and then kind of you know Put it into the blender and turn it into what you're <laughs> and, see, it, 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 and see what comes out. Down and remove all the unnecessary stuff, and then it fits into your six, sixteen kilobytes of code space or whatever you've got. Uh, yeah. So it's it's yeah it's 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 funny. Open source with embedded is also like when you're running embedded stuff, you want it to be reliable, really really reliable. So as much as you really would like to trust the open source community on that, you also kind of yeah. do your due diligence yourself, and so you kind of end up rewriting anything anyway. So yeah, yeah. no, no, it's, it's, I think that's important, totally especially on this security side too yeah. like you like yeah. you said you, you've got these devices sitting out in the field last thing you want to do is um and this uh, this was a news thing recently but someone was using cat m1 to download manga episodes like through <laughs> an array which i was like why <laughs> yeah <laughs> sure, surely yeah. why you don't need yeah like internet <laughs> anyway um yeah i think like the security side of thing i don't know like the esp uh 32 s2s now which i've got a bag of next to me Ooh. um they have um 512 certificates uh you can generate mm. on board and which is amazing because and i think that's the thing and i'm I, you know you were talking about this uh briefly as well is like seeing the hardware go through that um consumer cycle and knowing that you know you you make these tiny little 826 chips like cheaper and smaller than you know they'll be built into everything and sure enough they are now yeah, <laughs> yeah. even amazon's Which working is... with them now for some of their latest offerings yeah 
Yeah, I just got some Kogan light bulbs. Well, they would rebranded to you, but like they're normal size light bulbs with Wi Fi for ten dollars. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, um, Xiaomi, the Xiaomi ones as well. Are, like, yeah, what are they called? They're like, well, yeah, they're really cheap as well, and I think they're the really they're just, yeah, the O one ESP just doing its thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally just color, please. Yeah. Like, just w- what color do you want the light? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think, um, but I mean, you know, it has been it has been a time getting there, and I, I know the time, and I've watched you sort of grow over the years because we've known each other for ages. But um, the year that like, the eight two six uh 8266 came out like the arduino yun was kind of the only arduino connected wi-fi option and like i've still got one and it's like not good <laughs> but it was yeah. the, the first play that jason bridge is so latent anyway um what's um how did you go with the whole power side of things because i know um like connecting these devices that's one thing keeping them connected and keeping them powered whole other thing yeah mm-hmm. how does how does that process look when you're trying to productize something uh, do you want to start from the design side first, and I'll go? Yeah, yeah, sure. And you can finish off with a shout out to your best friends as well. Sure. The best of <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, on on the hardware side, um, it's always been like uh, looking at looking at this from a, a business perspective. The more data you can get out, the more value a product's going to deliver. If it lasts for five years mm-hmm. um, versus ten years, you can get double the ROI on something, and that could just be the matter of having a slightly bigger battery, or even better, making your code twice as efficient you know, and power uh, in the way the amount of power it uses. Um, a lot of what we do, my, my side of it was prof- profiling batteries. And so first of all, like we profile our load, get a general idea of what we want to do when we say wake up to take a sample and record something or wake up a sensor to actually upload a whole payload transmission. And you know, they're very varying um, power usage profiles there. Uh, but then we run that and characterize batteries. So we do accelerated testing on like, I've got tons and tons of dead flat batteries. Now, like, <laughs> we've got boxes of batteries that we've just taken just from this is our people. one sample box of just different random batteries that we're testing <laughs> wait are they just uh are they all charged those ones are uh there's another box that's so, completely empty about the same size oh, oh, that box. now i get to do a developer joke so you could say that's a powerful box <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> sorry continue <laughs> <James was laughing. laughs> a scary box of dead batteries oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's not powerful <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so we try and characterize them by doing accelerated life testing on the cells. And that gives us an idea of, you know, our choice of what power we put into a device and what kind of a return that's going to give us. Now, the other side of it is characterizing the device itself. And that's where James really comes in with his favorite test equipment. That <laughs> take over. Um, yeah. When it comes to power consumption, it's, it's, you've got to first get your code doing what you want it to do and you get the data you want to get out and then, then you measure it and you go, oh, that's using way too much power. What do I do now? And you've got to kind of start trimming and figure out what you're doing. We've we've come across this really good uh, set of test equipment that lets us do that. Uh, one of them is this thing called the Oti, O-T-I-I, and it lets you power a device while measuring its current consumption. So it sort of imitates a battery that also tells you how much power it's using. So that's you go through and write test routines or you just literally run your code on it and then you see how much power it's using. Uh, and then you can sort of figure out just how many messages you'll get out of, yeah, your your battery that you've now tested and you know how much uh, charge is in it and how much you can use. And then you've got how much it's using and you work your way from there. So, uh, nice. yeah, it's, it's a lot of testing and it can be quite tedious because you also want to make sure you do really long term ones because if you're talking to different modules, sometimes they're a little bit of a black box. You don't know 100 percent of what's actually going on in there. So if you, you know, send it a bunch of commands and tell it to go to sleep, cool, if you, you've gone to sleep. But then in an hour, it might go, well, I'm going to use a bit of power now. Why did you do that? <laughs> so so it, a bit of an analysis you need. It just um, uh, just dawned on me that your product, your end user product testing is literally getting a keg, putting this thing on it and then emptying the keg, right? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually fun test. <laughs> um, the um, uh, so you do, and I think you briefly sort of talked about a little bit uh, in that last bit. But um, you also do over the air updates by the sound of it. Um, how or you try to okay. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. configuration is the phrase we use because NBIoT yeah. is because our main main network we use is NBIoT because the amount of data you can use is quite small, uh, and because our devices are intended to be quite cheap. We can only use so much of OTA, so that's why I spend a lot of time testing, uh, so we can make sure we can have a device that's configurable and reliable out in the field. Because OTA does come with extra caveats as well. It's not particularly great for battery life if it needs to also do 
yes. a long flashing process. Like if we're trying to make this thing wake up and just go five seconds of airtime and then go back to sleep, this is a completely yeah. different uh, situation I, for it. I was going to ask about that too, whether you're doing like a deep sleep, network deep sleep, but it totally sounds like you are, which would make sense because yeah. that, that yeah. saves your precious, precious battery. Yeah, yeah, 100%. <laughs> um, yeah. We've got a question from the audience. And if anyone has got any questions, please put it in the Q&A section or just in general chat. I'm kind of watching both. But um, from Timothy, how bound to specific hardware is the sensor, e.g. how much effort would it take to port to another chip, to a different chip? And I can see James already sweating going, um, no. <laughs> but we've recently done exactly that. So we, we, we're we very much, uh, we'll use anything. So like, we've I just pulled this out actually because I thought it was funny. This is sort of the first thing that was, this, this is before me. So you could say that's the first ever binary sensor. So it'll go from using, you know, something like an ESP and probably just Arduino. Uh, out to our next sort of board sort of series, which was a Texas Instruments based module, this sort of one. And now we're moving into STM land and using ARM. So uh, and beyond we're, that into and yeah, beyond that into using uh, the module itself. The module really itself. So the yeah. the the actual narrowband IoT module uh, is a computer. So we can program that and tell that what to do. So we're kind of moving down that avenue as well to not have two different things that we have to program, but. In terms of how difficult it is, it depends. <laughs> it's getting easier as we uh, kind of we keep our own little code base as small as possible and my, and kind of flexible. So when we did our last sort of migration, if you will, I did get to reuse a lot of it without too much effort. So that was nice. Um, but it's definitely not. Yeah, you can't copy paste them for that'd be great, but you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think that's a, another really good question too. And this is one I'm always like, um, always looking at is because it's one thing to make the, a little prototype device. Mm. It's another thing to produce a hundred thousand of them. Yeah. But at what point do you go uh, off the shelf versus custom fab? And it sounds like you're going, starting to go down that custom fab path now. Oh, right from the start, um, there was always a vision to connect millions of devices. So we knew we had to have that core competency of developing our own devices from the ground up rather than going to an IoT provider and buying something off the shelf. But there also that one of the biggest um, differentiators there is in the enclosure design as well. James, do you want to pull up like well, basically if we're doing like a generic, um, you know, a generic product, you know, you put it in some off the shelf enclosure, whereas, you know, sometimes if it's a really unique use case, like with the beer or, you know, with the antenna monitors, you know, we've, we've put our own things in that have all special features and we're trying to cost, cost optimize there. So there's always yeah. this, um, you know, this point, it, it's different for every project, but say if it's going to be 3000 sensors, that's the point where we know, yeah, we're, whether or not it's profitable to develop our own bespoke enclosure, we just know we're going to do it because, you know, long term after that, intending to keep using, um, you know, selling more of, of that, that's when we go through the entire design process and develop it ourselves. So that, that yeah. Cross yeah. Point there. On the des design side, and this is just me being curious, but um, yeah, I do, like I do 3D printing stuff as well. Um, Tinkercad's my favorite. I know Kong, who's also in this meeting, he loves using Fusion, but um, what's your preferred? Um, oh, and I've been using VR lately, Gravity Sketch, which is pretty cool because you can walk around it and stuff. Anyway, um, yeah, what's your preferred um, software for modeling? Um, I'll, I'll start. Uh, when I got my first 3D printer, it was a very momentous and memorable day where I um, realized I didn't know the first thing about CAD or how to actually use the thing to download a few things pretty quick. Um, I, I actually got started in Rhino 3D, which is pretty old. Not many people use it these days. And it's very good for like square boxy shapes. But when you start going into, you know, nerves and stuff, it gets a, not as good. So, um, yeah. Uh, the small amount I've done is all, yeah, Fusion. 360, a little bit of it. Um, but yeah, generally, I have no idea what I'm doing. I make little boxes or a little hook or something like that. But usually, I just stick to code. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I dabble. It's, I mean, my biggest bug there is that whole two dimensional interface, three dimensional objects. It's mm. like, yeah, it's, it's there's a barrier. That's why I was hopeful VR, but yeah, it's a little bit too soon. Anyway, <laughs> um, we do have another question. Um, do you see test different? Uh, do you test different compression algorithms to see how they affect the power consumption? Yeah. Or James. yes, this is another yes. sort of, uh, trade off thing here because. Uh, so if we'll take temperature, for example. If you want to get a very, very accurate uh, temperature reading, you might want to be two bytes, but that means every single reading is double what you should need because if you don't necessarily need that accuracy, so you've got to kind of figure out what the business case needs first is the most important thing. If you 
talk to your customer and say, oh, the temperature is 46.2 degrees, 46.3 degrees. It's like, oh, 46 degrees. It's like, oh, why am I sending a decimal point? Like, what's the point? They don't care. So maybe that's where you can gain some battery life and literally halve the amount of uh, data you need to send for temperature by sending one byte. So it depends because if your customer says, oh, that's we 0.5 out is very bad, you need to then send more. So it's a, it's a bit of a trade-off, but sometimes you just sort of have to do it because battery life is kind of everything with these light, cheap devices. Um, and just the difference between sending one or two bytes for that particular piece of data, if you're logging, say, every yeah, five minutes or something like that, and then trying to cache that data and then upload all of it at once, now you've got quite a large payload you've got to send, and that's a bit taxing. So uh, yeah, it's a it's a fun problem to have, but can be time consuming. <laughs> it can be very time consuming, especially for larger oh. values like uh, the IMSI or the IMEI or something like that of the actual device. What's the um, actually? Uh, there's a good. There's another question off the back of this one. But um, what broker are you using out of curiosity? <laughs> the broker? You said broker. Yeah. Oh, don't you? Oh, oh, broker. No. Oh, you know, you broker. overhead. No, huh? no. We we kind of we use a UDP protocol and it's kind of our own thing oh yeah you're going direct yeah, yeah. nice that uh, it, it does actually no, make sense because no overhead <laughs> so yeah we, yeah yeah so, yeah even co-op or um you know mqtt for instance uh, even in the way you know traditionally you just send payloads in json right we can't afford to send that much data with all the overhead of you know, yeah. all the parameters um even with mqtt that's very chatty and there's a lot of back and forth and then you know you're looking at co-op that's more developed or lwm2m is one of the latest ones that's really pretty efficient way of doing message queuing of mm, stuff coming from the be. devices We've just built it from the ground up, though. I like we came back from the days of you know Sixbox and LoRaWAN, where you have twelve bytes per message, and <laughs> anything above that is kind of like bloat. So that's where you know we've really stripped it back to talking with our own endpoints on the servers, where we send data to directly. Mm. Well, we'll we'll literally discuss. Oh, should we be sending these extra two bytes or not? Like yeah, that's should we handshake and yeah, and like when you do the response, you know, try and why why do a response bigger than one byte? Like just say yes, I got it. So yeah, yeah we've we've kept that. Very trim again for battery life and cost it means you're using less data. Yeah, I was going to say that's really smart because, like, when you do it with ten devices, yeah, cool. But when you do it with ten thousand devices, yeah. yeah, that's a whole other whole other money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and and we have um, um, you know, we've used the TCP protocols and QTT protocols as well because if you have power uh, and your your data budget's not big, then you might as well go for those chatty protocols because there is benefits there. But if you don't need them, don't use them. I, actually, I was going to say, I read an article like a few days ago saying that there was um, alcohol, beer is being used to power things now. Like, can't you just like put a thing into the keg? And <laughs> some for you, some for me. We, we actually did a study <laughs> on solar. So we stuck a little solar cell in one of our, like when we when you do these enclosures, they do some T0, T1 runs, which are the first cut out of the mill. Then you can just put in whatever plastic you want. So we did them in clear and we, we ended up putting a solar panel inside for the beer keg to see like how much sunlight do these things see over their lives? And um, yeah, it, it really varies. Though. Like it looks like generally we don't want to try and power our sensors by solar because they spend so much time like indoors in a cool room with no light at all. But I then the after thing. running like a year trial uh, with one of Australia's brewers and we get some of these back, they're just sun bleached and like the, the plastic has seen that much UV and sunlight that they've changed color. And we're like, wait a minute. Some of these are definitely going to run just fine on solar. Yeah. So it really varies. It's, it's a really interesting study. Wow. Um, yeah, I would not have picked that at all. Yeah, I would have been at the same thing. Like, just goes in the room, it comes out, goes in a truck, and mm. like rinse and repeat. Yeah. Um, no, it's really cool. Um, did you have anything you wanted to talk about before we wrap oh, up? Yeah. Or if anyone yeah, we were going to talk about the pivot stuff, but yeah, no, that's uh, we were going to chat about. Oh no, kind of like we can keep going, but um, yeah, it was just uh, I guess that's part of our story that you know, starting at Binary Beer, we developed all this core tech. If anyone was here just wanting to hear about the pivot during the COVID epidemic. Um, um, that basically, oh, yeah, um, yeah we, we, at first it was a funny story that we thought beer is dead. You know, all of the, the breweries are shut down, all of the venues, no one can go there to drink anymore. And we specialize in draft beer, not just, you know, packaged beer as well. So it was a really big, um, scary thing for us to the point where we kind of thought, let's just build sanitizer. You know, it seems like we can't buy sanitizer. We'll just repurpose entirely. And then the next thought was, how about we just track ventilators or something and try and, you know, do what we can to help this pandemic that's going on. Um, but, you know, as, as we're going further now, and you know, in running binary tech alongside binary beer, we're seeing really interesting opportunities pop up in the marketplace, sort of things like um, caravan sales now are just, 
you know, they can't get enough caravans because people can't fly overseas anymore for their holidays. So it's one of those things where we're really glad that we started you know, putting together binary tech and repurposing that technology in a way that it's now more generic and we can pivot and be a bit more agile in the markets that we focus on as well. So, yeah, working in different spaces. Um you know, I was having so much fun geeking out with you both that I did forget about the <laughs> pandemic for a moment. So I, in saying that, I would have remembered my mask if I went outside. Um, but yeah, no, I think, um, and th there's a few companies that we've um, sort of talked to recently in some of our meetups that, yeah, same thing, like, you know, pivot really hard and fast. So um, no, how did you go from, and yeah, actually, Sorry, uh, jumping around everywhere, but um, how did you go? Uh, one thing I was really, really impressed with, and this speaks volumes to the open source community too, is the um, the whole open source maker movement. You mentioned the uh, ventilators there, and there was like 20,000 people at one stage in one of the Facebook groups that I was in just talking about ways to make these things like build out just to help people, which I thought was yeah. like phenomenal. Yeah. Like that's what, that's what the open source stuff's all about. Like even the face shields, few there's a bunch of groups locally actually some of our friends in Wollongong right. were yeah, um, doing, doing some amazing yeah. things yeah um place buzzing building those space shields yeah it was great yeah which I, I'd like again that's kind of that's my open source world <laughs> that's what that's what it's there for yeah. like to be able to help help people essentially but um how did you go yeah how did you go with the pivot with finding something to pivot to and then uh, running with it like you said you, you're uh, starting to produce um uh, hand sanitizer at one stage <laughs> we, we gave it a shot because um you know with the beer background we had a whole lot of beer kegs that you know we were going to be using with brewers as like samples get up and running with a smart keg and just borrow one off us and we were looking at all these different business models of how could we um yeah use our technology you know in, in different spaces here or even just use our resources um i think you know with a lot of the stuff that came from the government they were asking like what companies can repurpose and help us in what way and um yeah we kind of went in that direction and also went in the direction of hey can we help track um you know all of these ventilators because we understand that maybe there's a limit to how many we can produce but making sure that they don't get lost especially if we're using you know pop-up hospitals with beds in different places as well it would become this requirement but uh, you know as the way things panned out i think the government was just such inundated with offers of help the same way you're explaining that like in the maker community we just want to do anything we can to help and so that's kind of where you know when the government has to take in all this information things started moving very slow um so that's kind of now um, you know, we're seeing different ways, more, uh, how would you say, more organic ways to reuse our technology. It's not directly influenced by um, the pandemic itself. It's more of the, the ways that the market has changed with it and mm. ways we can fit into that. Mm. No, it's a really good point. And yeah, I mean, the, the dust is still settling with a lot of the changes that have been happening. So it's, um, yeah, it's it's good to see everything sort of starting to equalize out a little bit. Or as everyone keeps saying, the new normal, or the new, new normal, whichever one it is. <laughs> um, no, and I think um, I think you're right with the, the state, the government's kind of realizing that, um, oh, wow, this making movement, like it's got legs. <laughs> there's, there's people producing some stuff. And I know like the discussions I was having with the Victorian state government was sort of around how do you um, regulate that? Like, how do you know? Because I know there's uh, different printer types. Like I've got a $200 printer. It does or okay, but I'm not going to print like a face actual breathing mask with that because the, the particles are bad and it's probably got lead in it. Let's face it. I don't <laughs> use it for food grade either. Yeah. Um, what's um, what sort of things were you looking at um, sort of producing? Because I know you've got a few 3D printers there, don't you? Uh, yeah, there's one behind me, an old MakerBot that's still chugging away gradually. Nice. Um, yeah, we didn't really uh, get in on the 3D printing side of things. Um, yeah, th those were the kind of two areas, just with the sanitizer and the monitoring of ventilators that we were really trying to, to see what we could do to help. And, and who knows, that, that could be something that becomes... I hope it doesn't, but you know it could be <laughs> required in the future, I guess. And um, yeah, it's one of the things we have to keep our ears and eyes open for too. And it's not just from a a business perspective, like how do we make money out of this, but it's like how do we prepare ourselves to help if and when we need to as well in the future. Yeah, one area, yeah, which I think is fantastic. Sorry, uh, you sorry. One area that did come out of it is we're now working with some pathology companies. Um, you know, helping track oh, different yeah. samples as well because it's not necessarily COVID samples, but they're so busy with COVID now that they're having issues in their logistics and their supply chain processes, just, you know, trying to keep a handle on everything and trying to keep track of what's going on. There's just so much of it now. So our devices yeah. have kind of been ready to go to just put it in ESCII. You're tracking it. 
off you go. Yeah. So uh, yeah, working with um, some pathology companies now to do something like that, which is it just felt good. <laughs> that was cool. nice. Yeah, well, one of the yeah. latest use cases. Sorry to cut you off, developer Steve. No, no, no. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of came to us there, where um, like now that there's so much more going on in these samples being transported around, they're using external shipping providers more as well. When traditionally it'd be a pathology car privately driving around, whereas if you're using external providers, they start leaving these eskies of samples in places, and the de- delivery guy doesn't understand how important that is. Um, that's where there's this new need now to make sure that we're actually tracking like in real time where where these samples are going. Amazing. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the thing I always say to like to a lot of the devs that we engage with, is like, use your developer superpowers for good. And you're totally doing that because uh, that's what they're for, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like help people. So no, amazing job. And um, thank you for joining us. We have one more question from Tristan. Um, how are you managing security over a bespoke uh, datagram protocol? Now, uh, you don't have to answer this fully because I know also security yeah, yeah. is partly keeping it secure. It's a good so. question, but um, <laughs> we're also lucky in that um, on top of what we do, there's also the security built in intrinsically into Cat1 and MBIoT is very good. Telstra has a mandatory, for example, Telstra has a mandatory requirement that's encrypted on end to end and pretty much all the telcos are embracing that sort of mentality as well as that pretty much all the data is protected from that device up to the server. And then from the server side, you've also got private networks from the telco to our server. So it's something that kind of the telcos have put a lot of thought in this already for us, which is great because it made it kind of made what we wanted to do, which was use as little data as possible, much more feasible. So it was a kind of like, thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> And we also have a lot of fun around that as well, that like it is our duty to try and attack it as well. And, you know, looking yeah. at, you know, different yeah. different LP WAN technologies and the attacks that they're prone to um, and having the ability to do that. And same with like even RFID, the amount of like their security built into these you know, RFID chips. Yet most of the time you can just reprogram them with whatever you want. So it's it's like really um, fun to be on, on both sides of that in mm. you know, building the device that's safe, but also having a play to see what, what are the risks out there and what how open are other things as well. Yeah, yeah, which is always a concern because sometimes you don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the in- industry moves so quick as well. Like you know, even uh, the tiny little firmware updates are just going to mean that difference between someone not downloading manga and downloading that, manga. That is <laughs> like, yeah, that's well, where you know, just locking down the SIM cards and making sure that they can only talk to whitelisted IP addresses, for instance. And like you mentioned previously, just understanding if a different card, like a different IMSI, goes into a different device with an IC, uh, different IMEI, it's one of the things where we can trigger on the server straight away and just know something just doesn't stack up here yeah you know? so just having those alerts well yeah. built in yeah no totally agree um thank you very much did you want to do any shout outs any hey we're hiring or uh anything um i mean i don't want to put you yeah, on the <laughs> community the iot space um please if uh, anyone wants to chat more please reach out to us over linkedin i'm michael burton this is james rule and we love talking iot and we really believe in sharing information for the greater good so yeah if anyone wants to connect we're don't be shy we're, we're happy to chat Amazing. Thank you. And yeah, uh, everyone check out the website at binarytech.io. I-O. Yeah, I said that weird. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. um, you'll be uh, around for a, l- a little bit anyway. So I think we're about to continue on. And um, thank you very much. Great. Thank, thank, thank you. you.